Welcome everybody to the latest YY Open Roundtable. Today's Thursday, May 29th, 2014. I have as my guest and often visitor Clarence Leon. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, this week we're going to talk a little bit about um, the upcoming 3.17.2 release. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Pure, and then we'll talk about uh, the stuff that uh, Clarence is working on uh, related to app links. So first up, um, we have a 3.17.2 build uh, cooking right now. We're hoping that we can get, um, if you're out there watching this and it hasn't been released yet, please feel free to download that and try out, especially um, things around Loader. Um, if you have a special config or anything like that, please feel free to uh, check out the release candidate and give us feedback. Exactly. The goal for this release or for Free17 was that we want to modularize some of like the Loader code so that we can create like custom combo loaders. But we also came across like a few issues over there. And so like especially if you're using like groups of YUI modules, that's something really important for you to check out, right? Yeah, loader is one of these things that the more you, you touch it, the more it sort of morphs and tries to break things. So. Well, the goal is that we're trying to like improve loader even more. Yeah, so we'll exactly. See. Um, next up, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, if you have not checked out uh, Hacker News last uh, couple days or uh, Twitter recently, um, a new Pure release came out. Pure CSS 0.5.0 was released a couple days ago. Uh, and if you go to the purecss.io site, you can check out the SNASI site. And especially, um, they have a new um, starting page that uh, can introduce you to um, See which, which link is it? The Get Started uh, so, page. Yeah. The Get Started page is a brand new, uh, recently designed, and has lots of helpful uh, tips for, for you to get going on it. And they have a really cool widget on the Pure Get Started page. And with it, you can basically just select what you want your um, screen, uh, screen widths are, what you want to be your small screen width for a phone, a medium screen width for a tablet, a large screen width for desktop, and more. And you can just set that up. Just use the little like app that they have there and just create your own pure mobile grids. And so it's really awesome. So definitely check it out. Cool. Next up, we we have the the main sort of topic for today, which was uh, we've been working on some really uh, interesting uh, working on a really interesting project related to AppLinks. Maybe tell them a little bit about what AppLinks is. So AppLinks is basically the idea for um, it's more for native mobile apps, and the idea is that you can put a few meta tags on your mobile web pages so that it's easier for your, um, so that a native mobile application can uh, read those uh, meta tags and immediately be able to deep link into a native app. So the idea behind it is that we want to add like the most important part of the web, which is linking, back over to native apps. Right. So that's something that native apps don't really have right now. If you, you open up like any native app, you basically go straight to like the home or screen of that native app. And there's no really easy way to say, like, hey, I want to link to this specific screen inside a native app. And that's the benefit of app links. And this is something that's been driven by Facebook, but they also have like a whole bunch of other backers right now. They have Dropbox. I think Tumblr is actually on board now, too. And so one of the things that I've been working on on the side is that I'm building up um, an Express module called Express AppLinks. And the idea is that we're building it on top of our existing Modem components, and so that you would be able to annotate your routes, and you would be able to immediately just get those um, meta tags that you need for the AppLinks protocol right into your page. Cool. So what do you mean by annotate a link, though? Is that, how does that work? So basically, what we've been doing with like a lot of the Modem components is that you have the idea of these route annotations. And so, for example, they, these route annotations can be like labels. For instance, if you want to label like a specific URL on your site uh, with a, per, as, a part of, as being a part of a particular section. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like this part might be your app. This part might be uh, a section that's just like your static like about pages and right. stuff like that. Or your forums. Or exactly, yeah. But the thing that's even better is that it fits well with what AppLinks is doing because you can now like label your um, your uh, your HTML routes with the same routes that you might want to use for your native apps, for instance. Mm -hmm. So how you deep link into native apps is that you also use URLs, for instance, except you use a very like custom URL scheme. 
So instead of um, using like HTTP uh, yeah, uh, yahoo.com slash finance, you would just do like yahoo colon slash slash uh, finance, right? And so that way you use these custom URLs and on Android you can open them up and they'll go straight into the app through intents and on iOS it'll just jump straight into the app and your native app will be able to handle all of your code there. So when the native app is installed, it registers those as uh, handlers? On the uh, app. Yeah, exactly. So similar to what like a regular router would do, you can create the same thing for a uh, native app too. So what, what would be a scenario for that? Like say you're, you're viewing something uh, on a web page on say Yahoo, uh, like weather or something like the mm -hmm. weather DD, the direct display. Yes. Is that where example? So an example would be if you were on Yahoo Weather, for instance, and you're looking at the weather for um, Sunnyvale, for instance, and you want to link specifically to the Sunnyvale page, and but the person who has your app has the Yahoo Weather app, for instance. Mm -hmm. You can send them that uh, web link, and what ends up happening is that um, if you're inside the Weather app, for instance, they'd be able to like immediately like just open it up inside of the web. So it's a link you can send to the people like via email as well, or is it just uh, in behind the scenes? Uh, well, it's more behind the scenes. Yeah. What ends up happening is that you just parse the meta tags, mm -hmm. and your native app is able to like handle the transition between apps that way. Who's, who's doing the parsing? Is it the app, or is it the web browser? So there's a few ways that you can do the parsing. You can have like a back-end service. For instance, like Facebook is trying to build out something like that with their Graph API. Or at the same time, you can just have to do it on the client. So what you would do inside a native app is that you would just send a request over to an HTML page, take a look at the meta tags, and if the meta tags has an URL that you can open, then you open that up. Oh, so the app's doing the parsing in that respect. Yeah, in that case, yeah. Cool, very cool. And so the idea is that we're building these on top of our existing modem components, and so hopefully it'll be like just another component just you can in. plug in into your like Express app. Yeah, exactly. How does it get the metadata though for that? So, uh, like I said before, the metadata is just from your um, your um, meta tags inside mm -hmm. your HTML. Well, I meant I meant for the app. Like, how oh. do you generate? Like, how do you know that this app has five sections and each section goes to this place? So, what you would do in that case is that you would just basically have these, uh, you would set some settings inside your Express app. So just basically app.set um, iOS app store ID, for instance. Mm -hmm. And in that way, if a person wants to like link directly to like the app store, they can do that. So cool. yeah, so there's like a lot of stuff that can be done with it. It's definitely like a protocol that like a lot of larger companies are trying to push. And so we'll see how that turns out. Is it just a uh, web to app, or could it be app to app? Uh, actually, it's mainly for the app to app use case. It's not used for the web to app oh, okay. case right now. Right. So the idea is that if you are rendering out like uh, posts where people are sharing links, then uh, you can intercept um, you can intercept the tap to that link before it's people actually open out a web page. Right. And then make a request over to that web page grab that metadata, and then open it up in the other app. So it's mainly for the app-to-app -app right. case right now. How does that work? Like, I know with browsers, you can register like a, a URL moniker, like say map to link or I think in Chrome, you can register like plugins that handle. Is that a similar kind of thing? It's a similar concept. So the idea of deep linking has been here for like quite some time. It's the idea that you're just using a different protocol other than HTTP. And so if you want to open up an app inside uh, different uh, open up an app to that URL, then you can do that. Is it just destinations, or could you actually do like method calls? Like you know, you go to a destination, but it also you know does certain things. Yeah, so you can parse uh, pass data through the URL too. So it's just like you can pass it through a query string. It's like the exact same way that you would do it with a regular cool. URL. And that's what. Uh, so in terms of what you've been working on, how have you been able to like test this out? So the idea is that I'm just making uh, an Express module that follows like their spec pretty closely right now. So their spec has like a few like uh, little things that I want to make it easier for people to handle. So for instance, um, if you pass in this specific header, your app should return just like the meta tags at the top, so none of the actual content. And okay. that makes it easier for like an app to like just say I want only the meta tags, and then get that um, app links metadata, and they would be able to just like uh, use it 
and uh, just use it up that way. Is this related to Facebook's like Graph API? Because they have meta tags for that too. Is that, is that something? Similar? I think that's what they originally based it on. But the idea is that this is supposed to be like a more like public protocol mm -hmm. that anyone can use. So not just Facebook in this case. And can the, are the meta tags like static? Like once you've loaded that page, you can't change them or. So what do you mean by static? Um, I guess it's like a per request. I imagine it's just a payload, right? You make a request and you get back the response that has that data. Mm -hmm. It's not like a, an existing page. Sort of, like I say, a single page app, you can't modify those metadata tags. Per so se. you can, you would be able to modify them if you wanted to. The benefit really isn't there, because the idea is that this is mainly used in like the server rendered use case. So right. for instance, um, when you're on a native app, and you're trying to hit, um, you're trying to hit, you hit your server. Then you only want those meta tags to show up there. If you, if it changes like inside the browser, it's not going to make much of a difference because the link you share will be server rendered anyway. And how is this better than what we're doing now? Like, is this like a sort of a balkanization where there's lots of different ways? That... So right now, like apps are very like self-contained. They really are like walled gardens right now. The problem with apps is that they really break the internet, sort of. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you go into an app, and then you're inside this like little world that the app entirely controls. Mm -hmm. But if you want to like link to someone else's app, then what ends up happening is that you end up opening their mobile web component, even if you have the app installed. Right. Like, how many times have you opened up like a Twitter link in an mm -hmm. app, for instance? It takes you to a Twitter web page, whereas it's a better experience if you can just click on a Twitter link, mm -hmm. and you can open it inside the Twitter app itself. Or how many times have you done that? It'll ask you to sign in, and once you've signed in, you've lost all trace of the original link. You know, it just signs you in, and you're back on the Twitter page versus, like, the actual tweet that you're looking at. Exactly, yeah. So that's something that's, like, annoying for, like, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they're really helping to solve that problem. And so we're trying to see if we can, like, make it easier for developers to, like, uh, implement something like that, too. Do you think that they're going to try to propose this as like a spec for all apps? Or so it's a pretty like informal standard right now. I don't think they have like any like standards committee or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that people would like to follow. Have you seen much adoption outside of Facebook yet? Yeah, Pinterest, Dropbox. There's a lot of them if you take a look at the site. And um, let's see. Are so you, are you logged in? Uh, no, it's fine. So. Uh, Dropbox, Spotify, Pinterest, Hulu. So a lot of like different sites that already exist. Mm -hmm. And it benefits everyone, right? So for instance, if I'm like cre creating a new product, for instance, and I want to deep link into someone else's app, then all I need to do is just have a client that parses those meta tags. And then all I can do is just like replace my regular links with those uh, like operating system specific links. Mm -hmm. And then once I do that, then I can go straight into the other person's app. It's how just you, as, How do you discover those links? So yeah, like before, it's just basically those meta times. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is just send the HTTP request over, get those replaced. And once you do that, then they can just jump straight through. But I mean, is there, well, there, is there like a standard URL that you're requesting? Or you have to know, you have to know for, e for each app what uh, what URL to ping to get the metadata back. So basically, whatever the mobile web link is. So if people share a mobile web link, for instance, if they share um, if they share a regular URL, then inside that regular URL, when you render the page, the metadata is there. Oh, that's right. So they can put it on their homepage or anything they want to in terms of location. Yeah, exactly. I see. Do you see if it, um, well, I can see how you would you would basically have the links. Do the links give you any idea about what they do? Like you might see a link that takes it to it may say mail, but does that mean you know open mail? Does it mean create a new mail message? Is there any kind of API associated with so it? So that hasn't been defined. That's really up to the individual application developer mm -hmm. in that case. So in that case, um, that's however you decide to handle it inside the app. So what Express App Links does is that it'll recommend that you use the same URLs on both your web app, mm -hmm. your native apps, and everything in between. So right. the idea is that if you have these same URLs, then it's easier for you to structure your applications. If it's a native app, then you can structure it that way. 
If it's a web app, then you structure it the exact same way, and all of them are would be in sync. Are you working on like the, the web side of things, or also the app side as well? Uh, so I've been working with, on sort of both sides. Mm -hmm. So because part of it is making sure like both sides work together well. So making sure that you can parse that data, and making sure that um, it follows that right spec that they have on the website. So you if so you're creating the Express app links. So are you going to create like a uh, like an Android project and an Apple project as well that people could download? Uh, so yeah. they already have parts of that inside of um, inside of the App Links repo. So they have example clients of how that might work out. Right. And so that's like the reference architecture. Yeah. So one of the things that I'd like to work on too is I like to be able to create like a YQL table for to contain like all these App Links. Mm -hmm. So you would need to like store these app links yourself, you wouldn't need to parse the data yourself. Mm -hmm. Instead, what you can do is you can just access the YQL table, and it'll right. be a lot faster, because we cache all the data for you. Right. You can use our system. And you get whatever format, JSON, XML, whatever you wanted to as well. Exactly. Like you can just do, like, select uh, iOS URL from app links, where URL equals yahoo.com, for instance. And that's something that would be really useful. Like, since you don't need to like go do all the parsing yourself, it's a lot faster. In terms of uh, like demos or anything, have you got anything? So I'm still working on that right now. Uh, the idea is that we want to build an API that might work on um, both. Hey, <laughs> hey, welcome on. We sort of glanced up and noticed you there. So we want to build an API that would work for both Express Free and Express Four. So the first things that we're doing now is that we're porting some of the uh, older modem components like Express Annotations and Express Map over to Express 4 right now. So if you want to take a look at like the repositories that we have there, that's work that we're trying to do right now. And we're also might be changing the API a bit. There's been a little bit of funkiness that's changed between Express Free and Express 4, and we want to make sure that the API is the same between both of them. Right. So you're going to be like kind of like a, almost like a polyfill or like a wrapper around Express 4. Yeah, so the routes have changed a lot since then, like how routing works in Express. So originally in Express, you could just do like app.get. Mm -hmm. Now in Express 4, they recommend that you use the idea of a router. So the idea is that you would be able to limit your routes to just a specific URL so that nothing like conflicts with each other. Right. So like the idea is that, cool. yeah, that what they want to do with Express now is to modularize your app so everything is self-contained. So if you have an entire like blog app, someone could just do app.use slash blog and then your blog app. Right. And then that way like everyone can just like immediately like get components working, maybe even like npm install components. Mm -hmm. And so it would just be as easy as that. Cool. Hey Juan, welcome. I was gonna see if you had any questions for uh, Clarence about uh, the app link stuff. Uh, no, not so far. I'm happy to get a like a high level overview because I haven't been following the details. Uh, any stuff on your side? I know that you've been working on some more um, of the module loading stuff. So, do you have anything to talk about? Um, yeah. So today I I open sourced a couple of components under my username on GitHub called uh, module graph and grant module graph that just that given a set of um, ES6 module files they give you back a JSON file mm -hmm. with all the information regarding which imports you're using and what you're exporting from your modules. So you can do use that to do stuff like what we do in YY, you know, set up configuration for your loader to do either combo loading or prefetching or any other strategy like that you're going to try. And, you've and the idea is that I will, sorry? Uh, you've been experimenting with it on the pure site? And yeah, we, we I sent a pull request to the pure site. Uh, it's open right now. Uh, we have to deal with some um, conflicts. But it's already using um, Broccoli to run this this module graph uh, function and build in a JSON file, and from that, build in YY configuration. So uh, the good thing is that, uh, so right now, the 
the pure side has this file that contains all the what we config, uh, like in the traditional way, but just maintained by hand. And with this, you don't have they don't have to maintain it by hand anymore. It just happens uh, when you save a file automatically. You know, broccoli goes in. You know, it has its own watcher. Goes ahead and reads the file again, generates the output again, and it's running. And the benefit of this for the average like YUI user is that they don't need to write all of these like manual like module JSON files by themselves, right? Yeah, like the made as a JSON file, yeah. It's totally gone. Does it only work except if you're doing conditional loading, but, but yeah. Does it only work for ES6 modules that get compiled to YUI or, or can you use it straight from YUI? Uh, no, you, you you need to use ES6 syntax because uh, Syntax is actually what gives you um, the security that when looking at the code, you're actually getting the actual import and export information. Otherwise, you know, um, say if you were using something like uh, YUI, you would have to do something like, um, I think, Ilian Peche from Alloy wrote something that went ahead and looked into the yui.add function and try to guess at the dependencies. Uh, but there are many ways in, you, in which you can create those. Uh, you can uh, mess with the requires array uh, and you know, uh, uh, an study analysis tool won't be able to pick that up because it's so mutable. Mm -hmm. But right. since the ES6 syntax is static, you can look at, this, at the syntax and know exactly what you're importing. So you can almost use this as a way of like debugging your, your graph, right? If you found that something's not importing right, you can look and see what's generated and see if everything shows up properly. Uh, well, yeah. So I, I wrote it in a way that, sh that it should be useful for, uh, I don't know, something like ESLint to figure out if you're importing something from a module and that other module doesn't actually have it. Mm -hmm. Right. If you try to import, like, I don't know, uh, the one function from Node, but Node didn't have the one function, or, or you, I don't know, you made a typo in, in your import statement, it'll catch it in whenever you run ESLint. So. so if you have, like, dead code, for instance, it'll also get rid of that, too, because it'll realize you're not actually, like, importing this code anywhere. Uh, yeah, so that's the, the next step. The next step is figuring out a tool that, given this information, removes all the things that you're not using. Mm -hmm. So does Grunt module graph depend on module graph, or are they independent? Uh, yeah, so uh, we, we have all this, um, you know, by now an ecosystem of build tools. So I just, the, the part that deals with the source code and does the, the actual analysis in one module, and the other one is just a grand task that calls it. Can I uh, ask you to show like a quick demo or something, or show what it looks like? Um, sure. Let me see if I can I think it's demo. <laughs> uh, Let's say I have, let me create a folder here. So you're saying a prerequisite for this is if you're working on YUI, you need to find a way to convert the components the modules are working on to ES6 first, which we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. And yep. then we recompile them back to YUI. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, it's most, I guess it's mostly useful for uh, new projects, um, unless we figure out a way to easily transition big uh, with code basis to, to S6. Yeah, the main uh, thing which should be feasible, but we haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, uh, but let's see Lyman, I wish you had this last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just sent it to, to Simon, so he's, he's excited, excited about it. Well, I think it's important, even, even uh, like you said, it, it eliminates the need to do this manually, because even if you went through the process and you've got it all manually generated, um, if you're working on a team and things are being added, added and removed dynamically, you'll have to constantly keep that updated. Yeah, totally. OK, so I'm sharing my screen. 
Uh, do you see my screen? No. No? Yeah. Try again. Uh, oh, now we see something different. OK. Uh, so let's say I have, uh, I'm writing an ES6 module, and I do like import foo from some module. And then I'm exporting default uh, function. That returns foo. I save this as bar.js. And oh, I can't. I wish I could zoom the my console on Windows. I think you can, but it's kind of complicated. Yeah. Uh, so let's say you, um, I go into the folder that I created. I do dir. You see bar.js. So you just install this. Maybe you can cut um, that to a new uh, a new uh, Sublime window. We can see it. I can like put it here. So you can install it as a, like a command tool, like a global npm install. So this is installing a grunt module graph or just module graph? Just module graph. It, it's wow. already it's both a, a library and the uh, uh, command line tool. Mm -hmm. So then you just run module graph on foo, bar.js, and no, I made a mistake. Let's see, module graph should give me well, I guess I haven't debugged the, <laughs> the command line enough. <laughs> I probably had some tests today. Um, you have one that's generated, maybe? Sorry? You have one that's already generated? I have one that's already generated. Let me look for it. Uh, so when you see an example here. Let me show you on the, the tests that I'm using in, in the grant version. So in the grant version, I have like this module that you know, does a simple link for an export. And I want now one that's something pretty similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you run the grant task, uh, you can the default uh, output would be something like this. You know, just uh, an object which contains reference to your modules and all the dependencies for each of those modules. And then you have uh, a different mode, which is called uh, include bindings, which includes all the all the actual imports and exports uh, by name. So you get something like this. For module one, you get an object with imports. And now they're called exports. Right. And this is com consumable by why or is this a, a format that needs to be converted? Uh, no, you need to convert it to the traditional YY requires. Yeah. But but it, based on this, on the simple one, it's pretty similar, right? You just do something like turn into requires and You'll be good to go. Any plans to add that as a like a flag or something? Mm -hmm. uh, probably not for uh, these uh, command line tools or the grant tasks, but we may do something like this for I don't know Express YUI or I don't know. We're, we're oh, still figuring it out. That would consume this and output put that in. Uh, I mean, it's it's just writing a function. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's something that we could do, but well, it's in the spirit of like you know just easing easing the transition to folks from uh, uh, the transition the transition folks from uh, YY to ESX. 
Uh, right, so uh, the one thing is that even though this gives you the information for, uh, the, you know, the, the, the requires lists, it doesn't give you, it doesn't deal with path. So you still have to somehow um, generate the, the, the usual path information that we use in YY, like path equals that dot slash food. Module1.js, actually the mean. Well, would it be possible to extend it further to get the path to? I mean, if you're already iterating every, over every single file, I don't know. Uh, yeah, but we, you would have to know at least which theme, uh, which would be like the base directory. I guess we could do like a, a similar version that's specific for YY that takes a base path and generates like group configuration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also um, Yeah, I guess that that that'll work. I think you'd find a lot of people would 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 like that a lot. Even if you say it's a mere matter of programming, but uh, it would definitely. It also sort of helps uh, make sure that it's valid. Uh, valid by UI path. Uh, yeah, I guess it, it'll it'll make sense if if we generate like a whole group configuration from this. Yeah. Yeah, that's really awesome. I mean, so you're saying that you can get this today? These are uh, yeah, so this is already uh, in NPM. We just don't, don't have a YY-specific version. I would be the first one to start them. <laughs> ah, it's not uh, right. Yeah, there is a really star by Simon. <laughs> I, I got to do correct module graphs. That's really great. So your um, the idea is uh, where are we going to go forward with this? Is this uh, self-contained or like you said, there's is there what are you going to work on next? Um, so the idea is to keep working on on small tools like this that eventually grow out to be a whole developer workflow. You know, uh, tools for your editors, tools for uh, creating bundles uh, in a in a smart way tools for um, doing the things that we know based on, on our experience with YUI that work really well, be that uh, comboing or prefetching or conditional loading. And the idea is to, to s remove as much of the configuration steps that we have right now mm -hmm. and try to have smart tools that take as much away from that. Possible. Yeah, to me, one of the things I, I feel like it's a challenge with a lot of this is um, we're building a lot of these tools, and we all have like um, like a, a, a mental sense of how they work, but there's nothing out there that really sort of puts them together and says, "Sit down at your desk, go install these five things, go run this," you know, kind of like a cookbook style. Yeah, totally. So, um, what I'm doing is uh, once we we actually get a really clear picture of what are the, you know, two, three, four steps that you have to go through to, to get, you know, your base library or base module infrastructure. Uh, we can definitely start creating Yeoman generators for those. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. That's uh, cool. So I already have a couple, but since we're still kind of tweaking little uh, little parts of how we actually go ahead and compile modules and create all this information. I haven't published it yet. Cool. So it sounds like something in the future for both of these, potentially. So, so yeah, uh, eventually, if you wanted to, I don't know. I, 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 like I have a, a human generator that's specifically for writing node modules in ES6 syntax. Uh, it like creates all your base package.json configuration um, so that you only export uh, the build files and not the ES6 source files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's definitely the way that we want to go. Like give you a tool that sets everything up, and so you don't have to, so you don't have to understand how everything fits together. Is there anything? 
uh, this EDS is the way. You think the the, the module spec is, is stable enough now that you won't have to change things around? Uh, yeah, um, the syntax is definitely stable, um, and the loader side is actually going through a really interesting discussion today, yesterday and today. Um, if you guys have heard of Ian Hickson, he's the Hixie, yeah, Hixie, yeah, the editor of the HTML5 spec. Uh, so he's getting in touch with TC39, uh, the committee that standardizes uh, JavaScript to to see if, if they can avoid having more than one dependency system. Like, for instance, you have in the browser, you have uh, the meter. Yeah, six modules, but you also have dependencies that have to do with CSS, images, and all kinds of assets or other assets. Uh, so you have web components that are actually a mix of JavaScript and CSS and HTML, and you need to import those some, somehow, and they have their own dependencies. So there's an interesting discussion going on between TC39 folks and W3C folks uh, trying to see how they can integrate those systems without you know, having like two or three. Right, there's like three right now, right? Three main ones, one through script, one through. Um, uh, there, there seem to be like three main mechanisms for dealing with dependencies: the ES loader, uh, HTML, for, uh, HTML imports, which have some sense of dependencies, and they're considering something like um, a needs attribute for yeah. elements. Mm -hmm. So, you, if you have like a, an image that needs some CSS to be displayed correctly, you can say like IMG needs and point to a CSS file. And uh, once you scroll into your page and the image appears, it also goes and fetches the style sheet. So that's uh, like a brand new idea that they're thinking about, but they're wary about increasing all these, you know, the, these different type of systems that deal with the same right, be synchronized and so is it possible for all three of those systems to work together? Like, can you use all three if you really wanted to? Um, yeah. So I'm I'm not a fan of the needs attribute, uh, mm -hmm. especially for for scripts, right? Because the dependency is actually in the in the module mm -hmm. syntax. So right. um, if you have like a module tag that allows you to write uh, a module inside HTML, then I don't think you would actually need uh, like right. something. Right, so you're forcing the HTML to know to have an introspection into the JavaScript, right? Right, and and then uh, as far as you know, depending on CSS or depending on images, I think um, you know custom elements with HTML imports actually work pretty well. You know, you define a, a, an HTML fragment, and that fragment contains different style sheets and different elements. And then you go and insert that into your HTML page with a specific tag. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, webcomponents.org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Is that part of personal related to the Shadow DOM stuff, too? Uh, so the Shadow DOM part is is the one is the part that actually allows you to do encapsulation, you know, to hide things mm -hmm. in your custom element. But it's it, it's so the idea of web components is like the mixture between uh, all these different technologies: the shadow DOM, the custom elements, and the HTML imports, which allow you to create something like what we used to do, call widgets, but with native or with mm -hmm browser or web platform technology. And the idea is that they already deal with uh, with dependencies in a way. You, you could have a web component with a custom element that depended on other custom elements. So yeah. I'm not sure we need that third mechanism. Yeah, I can't wait till this is all sussed out, because I feel like, um, for instance, browsers will be able to cache 
things a lot more intelligently. They'll be able to. You can be able to tell to tell a browser, "This is my app. Please cache these three JavaScript files for a long time," versus just loading things and kicking them out. Uh, yeah, that's another thing that it's an interesting thing that they mentioned. And they're depending on like a, like an attribute for uh, script elements and and style sheets that allow you to and, and images too that allow you to define when that resource is loaded. So for instance, you could define an image to be loaded uh, as late as possible. So it would only be f loaded when the image is closed into view without you needing to write like, you know, like a YY or jQuery plugin to do that. So one, I got a comment from IRC Hatch saying, uh, he says, man, I really wish the loader would tell me which dependency is missing. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I saw his, his comment earlier. Uh, I'm not sure we can actually do that. <laughs> like a um, or something, you could run it, you know, like a trial run, and it could like. So the, the, if you have something missing, uh, it, it could be one of two, right? It could be like pointing to the wrong URL, which is something that the YY loader should be telling you now if you did it wrong. Like if you try to load a module but that module wasn't there, mm -hmm. uh, the YY loader should be saying something, right, either in a debug message or in the on error callback. Right. So there's that case, but then there's the case where you didn't even try to load it, right? Uh, yeah, and the case where you didn't even try to load it, um, so that one might be covered by the ES6 syntax combined with something like ESLint, right? Because if you didn't import it from somewhere and you try to use it, then you have a reference to a global that doesn't exist. And that's something that you know JSLint already knows how to how to tell you that you did. Am, am I making my am I making some sense or Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well um Outside of that, do you have anything else we wanted to cover? Uh, no, it sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, Juan, well, uh, you have you, you've done like an entire talk. <laughs> like, check it out. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, any any updates on the Y Promise stuff? Uh, not yet. So we're using Y Promise as uh, like a guinea pig for figuring out this whole workflow in a way. Because uh, I so I, what I did is rewrite it as an ES6 module just to see how it looked like. And now we've figured out how to first transpile it into, into um, ES5 or <coughs> ES3 in, in this case. And then from that, import it back into YY. Uh, and the biggest roadblock that I've had, actually, yeah, I, I, should, I would consider there is blocks. Uh, is because uh, the package manager that we want to use is it's Bower, but Bower doesn't work exactly the same way as npm does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it just links to a Git repo, right? Uh, where npm actually goes and creates a pack, creates a zip file, and upload it uploads it somewhere. So if you have source files written in ES6 or written in CoffeeScript or any other language that you need to transpile first, then um, in order to publish to Bower, you would actually have to have the built file in the repository. Yeah, so you have twice as many files, right? So to speak. Um, we already have the experience uh, with YY with dealing with uh, the build files in the repository, and it's, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty painful. painful. So yeah, as, as long as Bower doesn't actually host any zip files, I'm kind of blocked on that. I see. What about things like Browserify or whatever? And Browserify uh, has actually gained some traction lately. Uh, if you look into the NPM registry and you search by keyword, and you use the browser keyword, 
you, you will actually get a lot of results. Uh, people are starting to use NPM as, as a repository for um, modules that actually are used in a browser with Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. And I think we can do something that's uh, at least as good as Rosarify, if not better, based on ES6 modules. There's already ES6 <laughs> uh, which <laughs> kind of does that in a way. Um, ES6 ES6 yeah. Uh, I think it has some quirks that need to be ironed out. But. And this all begs the question that the, the browser should be doing a lot of this anyway, right? Uh, yeah, totally. So that's a future, future thing. Yeah, we shouldn't need browser. Fine yeah. Or... So the idea is that like browsers will eventually like do all this for us. So we'll see. Awesome. Well, um, thanks everybody for coming, and thanks for our, our one viewer and all the people who are watching this because we get quite a few tra quite a bit of traffic after the fact. So um, if you're watching this and Again, if you ha if we haven't released uh, three seventeen two yet, please uh, go grab a copy and try it out and try to break it for us, especially in loader, so that one will feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you know if there's anything from and um, and uh, from is it Andrew, yeah, Andrew Nichols in terms of other things you may have found since that patch? Uh, no, I haven't heard from him. No. But, but yeah, thank, it's a big thank you to, to Andrew for figuring out my, my mistake as fast as, as he did. I, I've learned a long time ago that if you're not like breaking the build every once in a while, you're not really a, a cutting edge. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, in, in this uh, case, <laughs> I actually learned to, to, well, first of all, you know, uh, have as much test coverage as you can. Uh, it, it sucks, but it's it's for the greater good, and and yeah, you know, um, if if you've found something broke, and you're running to fix it, once you actually find found the problem, uh, actually take some time to go through the actual solution. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're gonna close up for this time around, and thank you guys for coming. Another awesome roundtable. Every time this happens, it's like it's gonna be great. Every night, every time we do it, it's great. So, <laughs> we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. See ya. Okay. Later. <laughs>